Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to discover your unique life's purpose and what you're truly worth, then do we have the Book of Knowing and Worth show for you. Today I'll be talking with Paul Selig, medium and author of I Am the Word, the Book of Love and Creation, the Book of Mastery, and the Book of Knowing and Worth. And that's just what we'll be talking about today, about the Book of Knowing and Worth, finding our own purpose, worth, and greatness. That plus stepping through doorways, leaving packages at the door, and what to do when you discover your kingdom. So welcome back to the show, Paul. Are you ready to shine? I'm ready to shine. Thank you. And you are shining bright and a mighty woohoo! And to you. Thank you so much. I was mentioning off air, and I've got to thank you again on air. Your show last year was one of the most incredibly well received, and speaking personally, one of the most important for us. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for having me back. You're most welcome. So from there, for those who haven't heard you before, would you mind kind of giving us a Paul Selig 101 or how you started down this path or how they started down this path for you? Well, you know, I, I didn't expect to be doing the work that I'm doing. This was never really a career path that I envisioned for myself. I was raised something of an atheist. And when I was 25, I began to open up really out of sheer necessity, not because I thought it would be a nice thing to have a spiritual life. I didn't even know what a spiritual life was or that that's something someone could have or might want. Um, but I had a bit of an opening and I had a bit of an experience when I was 25 as well of energy that to me was, was profound enough to keep me on the path that I'm still on. I had an experience of energy moving through me and I sort of seeing the lights around people and you know, then studied a form of energy healing and found that when I had my hands on people, I could hear things for them. So I was developing as a clairaudient without knowing what a clairaudient was. And I was developing as an empath or as a clairsentient without really knowing what that was either. Um, I found that I could hear for other people. So if you want to know what's going on with your sister, who you haven't talked to in three years, and you give me her name, I could step into your sister and sometimes begin to resemble her and hear what was going on. So it's a way of sort of operating telepathically. Um, it's, it's a little unique because I work mostly with the living. And I also began doing a group in my apartment that meant every, every week just to sit in the energy that would come through and the instruction accompanied the energy. And um, I did this in my apartment very quietly, probably for 18 years or so. Um, I was a college teacher. I taught at NYU for 26 years. I ran a graduate program at another school. So I had another life that I was somewhat protective of. Um, And in 2009, my guides announced that they had a book to write. And if I took two weeks, they would do it. And they did. It was called I Am the Word. And it took two and a half weeks because I took two days off to go teach. And that's the first of now there are five books. The fifth one is coming out in June, which is called the Book of Truth. Um, and all of these books are the unedited transcripts of these sessions. Um, I'm a spoken channel. I'm not a written channel. I don't write the books. My name is on them. I sit in a chair and I close my eyes. There's somebody on the phone um, in Berkeley, California, who is sort of the active listener. Um, mm-hmm. She's been there for all of the books, although the last book or the newest book, about 100 pages at least, was dictated before students um, at the Esalen Institute where I was teaching a workshop. So the guides will come through with any opportunity and teach. And it's their teachings once transcribed in book form become the text that I've become known for. Um, So that's my work now. I left academia. I'm doing workshops all over and I have a little practice and I, I help people, I hope, with their lives. But a lot of what I do is bring through the information And when I bring through the information, there's a very palpable energy that accompanies it. My guides work with attunements to frequency. And so they're attuning people and getting them to work with the frequency that they operate with, which is really here to support us in our own evolution and, you know, shifting our vibration to to a level of awareness of our unity with our source. It's the easiest way I can put it. Thank you. How much have the guides changed you? 
You know, I, it's hard for me to say because I see myself and I'm aware of the parts of my life that I think should have changed the way I wanted them to mm -hmm. and perhaps haven't. Um, my life is completely different than it was even two years ago and um, very different than it was many years ago. And some of that's growing up and growing older and some of it's learning through this teaching not to make choices based in fear, which is one of the big teachings of the guides. Um, how does my life change? I mean, truthfully, I'm walking around hearing people's thoughts, you know, and and getting them validated. I mean, it's, it's one thing to think you're hearing somebody's thoughts. Another one, it's another thing to say, you know, who's Stephen? Why are you thinking about him? And says, oh yeah, I have a date with him and I didn't even say anything about it. So that's kind of my, my normal state of consciousness at this point is to be able to feel and hear and, you know, occasionally see for other people. And my own life as a result of this has sort of moved into a place of acceptance of phenomena and which I think is is unique, mm -hmm. but it's something that I'm able to share with people in ways that are, are very real. So when I work, people are having sort of a shared experience of, of spiritual phenomena and energy that's that can be quite extraordinary at times. And to me, that's rather, you know, it's what I do. And my personal life, you know, there's more to be done. I'm still kind of shy. I still want a partner. I still like complain all the time if I can, and it doesn't get me anywhere, but it's a habit. And that's my personality self still seeking to affirm its, its right to complain, even mm -hmm. though it never really works. But, you know, my life is, is a very, very different kind of life than it ever was, and truthfully, than I ever thought I would be living. Thank you. How has it changed, would you say, since last year, and, and <laughs> has fear played a role in it? Sure. I mean, I left my job of 26 years at NYU um, a year ago last fall, and I left a job that I'd had probably for close to 17, 18 years running a graduate program at another school where I'm actually now on the board of trustees, which was kind of wonderful to leave one job and then move into another position at the college um, because I care a lot about learning and I'm at my heart a teacher. That's mm -hmm. part of who I am. So, you know, my idea of stepping away from security and benefits and retirement and all of those things, you know, when you're in your in your 50s, you think about sometimes to step out into a, a work where I show up every other weekend or so someplace and close my eyes before a large group of people and hope that something comes out of my mouth. I can't prepare for what I do. I don't know what the books are I, until they're dictated. I've been given the title of the one that's coming next, mm -hmm. which is more than I often get. I didn't know the book of knowing and work was the title of that book until they announced it when they were dictating the prologue. And I went, okay, I guess that's the book and that's the teaching. So, you know, it's an act of faith to continue to show up for this work for me. And I just have to trust that, you know, so far I've never shown up someplace and haven't received the transmission. And so I have to trust that that's the deal that my guides and I have, is that if I show up, they will teach, and they've said as much. And so far, that's been my experience of it. Do you think that's the case for everyone if we're able to, well, we're going to get into it, know who mm -hmm. we are and start to drop some of the boxes that we put ourselves in? You know, I suppose that's true, but I don't know that that means that somebody needs to be channeling. I mean, channeling is an odd skill or ability or whatever you want to call it. I don't know how desirous it is. I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm taking dictation. That's a lot of what I do. It's not a terribly sexy career. You know, here I am listening and repeating everything that I say as it comes through. I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it, don't get me wrong, but I do think that as we move into our own, own knowing and our ability to access our, what the guides would call our true selves, and stop over identifying with the personality structure which wants to tell us who we should be mm -hmm. based on what we've been taught to be, you know, in our childhood and our cultures and the time and, you know, year we were born in, all that stuff, once we stop attending to that as the truth, 
and we begin to move to something more, more, more infinite, the infinite self, as the guides have often called it, we begin to access a very different way of being in the world, which I think is pretty positive. Woohoo! So, so let's let's talk about that, and let's dive into this book. I think you've already answered the first question, which is, how did the book come about? Which is, you didn't know it was coming about, and and the second mm. question would be, did they give you an idea of why this book? Well, you know, I've been teaching this stuff in one form or another every week for a long time, and by teaching, I mean I'm showing up and channeling in front mm -hmm. of people. And so I knew that there was a book coming um, because they said we have another book to write. And I think, I think the book of knowing and worth might have been the first book that the publishers expected from me, which was also very weird because the first two books, I had no idea if they were really going to happen until they happened. So I knew that there was a book and the teachings, or at least some of the teachings in the book of knowing and worth were teachings that I'd grown somewhat comfortable with only because the guides had been teaching them publicly. And I found that the workshops that I do or the live streams that I do are often the vehicle for the guides to bring out a teaching and refine it. And then when they're ready, we sit down and they go, here's the book. Usually, in my experience, and this isn't always true, it really was not true at all with the Book of Truth, which is the one that's not out yet, and it really wasn't true almost at all with the Book of Mastery, the one that preceded it. But in every other book, they've gotten me comfortable enough with the concept mm -hmm. that they're going to bring through, that once they start the book, I'm willing enough to go on the toboggan ride with it without knowing where they're going, because it's familiar enough that I'm not going to be stopping the dictation every 15 minutes saying, what the hell are you talking about? And I do that in the books. In when Book I'm, of Mastery in particular, you were doing that. You're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> there were a couple of times in the Book of Mastery where I went, whoa, 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 because they, I, the, for the first time, really, in my experience of them, initially, I thought that they made a statement that contradicted themselves. Mm -hmm. And that really floored me. I mean, earlier they say, nothing is real. And I went, okay, well, I've heard that before. So I could sort of let that go. And then the next chapter, they say, now here's the teaching for the day. Everything is real. And I was like, wait a minute. And I panicked. And then they talked me down from the roof. And I think this is all in the book and, and explained it. And, you know, later, um, I was doing a teaching, um, at the Esalen Institute. I was co-facilitating with Jeffrey Kripal, who ended up writing the introduction to the book of mastery. And mm -hmm. Jeff is, a professor of religious studies um, at Rice University, and he's, he's a very well-known academic and an expert on Gnosticism, you know, of all things. And when I explained that to him, nothing is real, everything is real, he said, oh, yeah, 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 that, that's Meister Eckhart. That's Christian mysticism. Nothing is real in form. Everything is real in spirit, which was the guide's teaching. You know, but because it was brand new to me, I was thinking as I do sometimes that there's a level of accountability that I have for the teachings, which is really not my business, but because my name goes on the cover, I've had this feeling that, you know, if my name's on the cover and they were to say the moon is really made of green cheese, I'm going to have to contest that somehow, or at least question the teaching, which is where I often interrupt in the newest book, the book of truth, they actually found a way to circumvent my interrupting the teachings, which was they started anticipating my questions before I even formed them. So in the book, I don't think I interrupted mind once bender. in that book. It was a mind bender, but I'm doing the dictation, and then they're saying, now Paul is wondering, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I was about to wonder, <laughs> was about to form a question, because I'm sort of receded in the background mm -hmm. as the dictation is happening. So they would anticipate the question or move it in the way that they wanted. And the, the, what's funny about it for me was you would see in the book things like, you know, Paul is asking if I'm walking down the boulevard with my fellows. And I've never said, you know, walking down a boulevard with my fellows in my life. That's their language and vocabulary. It's their way of expressing. But what they managed to do was keep the teaching really on track. And I think that the interruptions are helpful when people, I've heard that from people who've read the book, but I feel that the Book of Truth is such a pure, pure channeling. I mean, 
I was so receded for that. I mean, dictation was so careful. I literally, with that book, I was I closed my eyes and I literally felt like I was reading a text, wow. comma, semicolon, M dash, the whole thing. It was that specifically announced and articulated. And much of this happened, and a third of the book was channeled before an audience, which had never happened before. Sometimes we've done a little bit. I'll, I'll do a live stream lecture, and the guys will say, oh, can we... Uh, the guys will say, and this is in the book, and that's how I know, and then I, I have to honor that. Mm -hmm. But this whole other thing was it was a very different experience. So I, I went off and I digression, so so forgive me. I forget what your initial question was. Well, it, it's fascinating, and it kind of kind of gives us some guidance with the book of Knowing and Worth. I think I'm going to dive in something I was journaling this morning. I do automatic writing every morning. I don't claim, mm -hmm. I don't claim anything. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just write. Something comes out. I look at it. Sometimes uh -huh. it's interesting. And this morning there was one that, that struck me interestingly because I, I never write about Christ. It's just, uh, maybe it's yeah. my Jewish upbringing. I've also uh -huh. gone to church and I've gone to Catholic school, so who knows? But I just it's just not part of what comes out of me. And this morning was coming out some, some Christedness. And then in mm -hmm. your book I read, When You Know You Are the Christ— the aspect of the creator that may be informed. So I think we need to go start mm -hmm. down this rabbit hole. Well, that's their definition of Christ, you know, and that's been the definition in every book. Um, and in the, in the book, I'm the word, which was the first book in the series, they begin unpacking language or mm -hmm. re or, or, or redefining it, perhaps. Maybe I don't know the right way to say it. And they called the word, the energy of the creator in action. That's their definition of the word or the creative principle that brings things into form, but the energy of the creator in action. And they use the word Christ to mean the aspect of the creator that can be realized in material form. And they say in I Am the Word and in the subsequent books as well, that this is something that happens. It's not a theoretical shift. It's not, well, I'm going to be Christ-like today. And they mm -hmm. say it's really not about Jesus either. They say, although Jesus is one who realized that principle, the divine self and realization, and they say it's been done by others as well. But they say that the realization of the divine self, and they call, they call it different things. They call it the true self, the infinite self, the Christ itself, the true self. I mean, these are the names I'm, I've been used to hearing from them. And it's pretty non-denominational, I mean, the way that the way that I operate, but it, but it really is a reclaiming of the idea. So I think the difference here is they say it's who you become when you know who you are. And that's not about appropriating an identity. It's about claiming your true identity and that the personality structure or the idea of who we are based on our world and how we've been treated and how we've been raised and how we see ourselves as a personality that's really not the truth of who we are. There's a place for that part of the self, but it's not our authentic or eternal self. Who is? And this is a very big question that the whole book dives into, and we'll, we'll go into some specifics. Mm -hmm. But since we're segueing there, who is our authentic self? Um, let me see what they want to say. Who you truly are who you truly are when you don't know when, when you don't know who you've been and and you haven't been instructed to be a certain way, to be a certain way, who you are always in truth, who you are always in truth, an aspect of creator, an aspect of the creator here and now, here and now, manifestation, in manifestation, that expression and expression of the divine self, if you wish. The divine self, if you wish, the aspect of you, the aspect of the creator as you in form and field, in form and field, is who and what you truly are, is who and what you truly are, but this happens to women. But this happens through a level of agreement or consent or consent to be what you are, to be what you are, every centimeter of you, every centimeter of you is of your source, is of your source. The idea, the idea that you are here, that you are here and there's a divine frequency and there is a divine frequency operating somewhere up there, somewhere up there must be released, must be released because you are one with your source, because you are one with your source, with 
whether or not you accept it, because you can't be other than that, because you can't be other than that, your experience of yourselves. Your experience of yourselves as much as, as independent from your source is a lack of truth, is a lack of truth being expressed in form, being expressed in the form. We assist you. We assist you in recovering, in recovering and reclaiming, and reclaiming the authentic self, the authentic self who knows who he is, who knows who he is in form and field, in form and field, period, in the same period. So that's them, and that's how I channel. If you don't know what I whisper the words, and then I repeat them. It's just you get, it takes a little getting used to. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and, and uh-huh. thank you to the guide. So if we unpack that, and there's mm-hmm. so much in there, one of the key terms that hit me is agreement. Yeah. Accord, accord. Agreement and accord. So they talk about vibrational accord. I mean, one of the things that they've said in their teachings is that everything that you see before you, you're in agreement to. Agreement doesn't mean I chose it. Like I didn't make the war in Iraq, you know, but I am complicit to its being because it's there. And because I'm there as the perceiver, that means there's an energetic accord. So they say everything that you see before you, you're agreeing to. And what you're agreeing to, you're shaking hands with. In other words, you're, you're holding, you're mm-hmm. in energetic congruence with. And they say, you know, if you're not in, if you don't want to be with it, stop shaking hands with it, stop agreeing to it, because that's how you're going to lift to a higher level of claim. So there's individual claim and there's collective claim. And I think as the guides are going farther in their teachings, they're actually, you know, working more and more with the idea of the collective manifestations that we've come to to agree to and in some ways have been claimed by. So the idea of agreement means acceptance or um, accord. And they use the word accord to mean, you know, a, if they say A-C-C-O-R-D um, with our, or energetic accord, which is, you know, in resonance, A-C-H-O-R-D, mm-hmm. like a chord in a piano. What is the most important thing we can do to shift or change this agreement to really start to understand who we truly are. Allow yourself to be who you truly are. Well, they're saying allow yourself to be who you truly are and stop aspiring to do it. And stop aspiring to be what you are not. The true self knows who he is. They're saying the true self knows who he is, knows who he is. He doesn't seek approval. He doesn't need to dominate another right? He doesn't need to be right. He knows who he is. He knows who he is. And who you think you are supposed to be is always at the cost of the truth, is always at the cost of the truth as you accept what you are. As you accept what you are, the divine in form, as you are the divine in form, as you have become your potential, you begin to realize your potential in manifestation, in manifestation, which means in form, which means in form. You have taken form. You have taken form to replicate, to replicate the divine principle, the divine principle in all you see, in all you see. Behind that. But you cannot do that if you're operating in a belief in separation, if you're operating in a belief in separation of the body itself, that the body itself is outside of source, is outside of source, claims you as separate, claims you as separate. Separate once you realize that what you are, once you realize that what you are in manifestation, in manifestation, like it or not, like it or not, agree to it or not, agree to it or not, is in this vibrational accord, is in this vibrational accord, you can claim and express it, you can claim it and express it, your expression of it, your expression of it is what calls the world to you, is what calls a new world to you, period, and they're saying period. It's it's interesting. Again, many directions. And thank you, thank you, thank you to, to the guides. And thank you, Paul. Mm-hmm. Uh, expression, direction, uniqueness, by letting it all go, and and, mm-hmm. and, and, that's, and that's really dropping the old construct into who we are, that doesn't mean we're letting go of our uniqueness or what we want to do in life. Well, no, you're not losing your uniqueness. But if what you want to do in life has been prescribed by an idea of who you should be, you may well, you may well find that you let it go because it was never true anyway. You know, I mean, in my practice, I, I read for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people often say, well, I don't know how I serve, you know, and the guides say, well, how you serve is how you're most fully expressed as your true self. And they also say that the true self knows how it's expressed. So as you align to the true self 
And that's this claim they work with. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know how I serve. And they say that that is claimed by the true self, not by the personality structure. Can you repeat that for me one more time? Because that's such an important uh, statement. Mm -hmm. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know how I serve is the claim of the book of knowing and worth. I know who I am as an aspect of the creator and the creator. I know what I am in form and manifestation. How I serve is how I am expressed as this mm -hmm. in my life as the true self. And that calls to you your, your way of expressing. But I remember once, and I read for this really nice guy one day who was a very successful, I think, attorney. And he was questioning what he was here for. I mean, what his work was. I don't know what it was. And, you know, and I kept saying, I don't know why. I keep seeing you tending bar. And the guy's jaw, jaw, his jaw dropped. And he said, you know, the happiest summer of my life was when I was tending bar in college. It was the happiest time I ever had. And you know what? He might have been a much happier bartender than being a, a successful attorney. You know, so this idea of who we think we're supposed to be um, is often not even our own information. We all think we're supposed to have a career. You know, I think 50 years ago, people didn't think about their careers in the way we think about them now. Mm -hmm. But now you're not realized if you if you don't have something called a career or, you know, we think we're supposed to have a lot of money. Really, it's like who says, you know, I mean, one of the, the challenges with a lot of new age teachings is that they became about getting a bunch of stuff, you know, and if I can manifest this, I'm going to get what I need. But much of what we think we need is what we've been taught to want or have. Now there's nothing wrong with having stuff and having stuff you enjoy. So don't, don't get me wrong there. But I do think that if the message is that we're not, that we're going to sacrifice our authentic self to be what we think we should be, then maybe we don't get it. You know, maybe it's not the best thing for us to aspire to. But I think we get rerouted then in, in higher ways. You know, I love teaching college. It was hard for me to leave that. And I was trained as a playwright at Yale, and I was a really good one. Mm -hmm. But I didn't love doing it. You know, I really hadn't loved doing it for a long time. But it was very much who I thought I was supposed to be in the world. And I was very attached to that. And once I stopped being attached to that, I felt really quite wonderful. And my other work came through really quickly and fully. You know, once I was willing to let go of who I thought I was supposed to be, I could start to claim who I am. And all of my abilities, whatever they are, were, you know, came into play. I truly believe that nothing is ever wasted that anybody does or learns through. It's all going to be used in some wonderful way one day. Thank you. And it, it sounds like you need, in a sense, that, that at least half-empty cup, if not empty vessel, to make room for your, your, great, your greatness to come through. I think it's about not being attached to what it's supposed to look like, which is usually the small self's idea of what it's supposed to look like. You know, when I was 25 years old, and I'm 55 now, yeah. just... And I was just opening up spiritually. It was sort of, you know, New Age Central in New York in 1987. I had a vision of myself doing Tai Chi at this age, doing Tai Chi on the roof of the same building I lived in with long hair down my back, wearing white and wearing some 20 pound crystal or something like that. I don't have any hair. I couldn't imagine living in that building again, but mm -hmm. at the time I couldn't imagine living elsewhere. I never learned Tai Chi, you know, although I think it's lovely. That was my idea of who I should look like based on some concept of what it meant to be a certain kind of person in the world. And what I resemble now isn't like anything that I was ever taught to agree to because there was no model for this, at least when I was growing up. So I just show up and do it and hope I can hear, which is my job to show up and hope I can hear. I like it. On the show up note, maybe you can tell us you were shown many time an image of a package outside the door. Well, you're, you're referencing a book that was channeled mm -hmm. and they did, they do talk about, and I do recall this from the book of knowing and worth, they say, you know, very often we, you, you ask for something and we leave the package on the door, but you don't open the door to claim it. You know, I, I think that that's what you're talking yes. about. And I do recall that. 
And, you know, pretty much they say, you know, we're always ordering off of the menu that we think we can order from. So, you know, and we only get what we expect to receive at a certain level. So the example they give sometimes in the book is, you know, if you go into a restaurant with five dollars in your pocket, you don't order the steak. You don't expect to. You may order the soup if you're lucky. You know, if it's a diner, you make up. You may be lucky to get the soup. You may get a roll. You know. So you know, and and it kind of works that way in terms of of, of receptivity to receive. If I don't believe that I'm worthy of something, I'm not going to be able to receive it, even if I claim it. Now, the idea that our worth is contingent upon what we look like, our credentials, our academic background, our marriage, our standing in a culture, I mean, that's all really transient stuff. And in the book of Knowing and Worth, the guides are really speaking to our inherent worth. You know, you were born, you have a right to be. It's really that fundamental. You were born, you have a right to be. And because you have a right to be, you have a right to receive. You know, there's a, there's a teaching that they don't do much anymore, and perhaps because it's in the Book of Mastery, actually, mm -hmm. but perhaps because I haven't fully worked with it yet, where they talk about manifesting and creating, and they do this thing called the mudra of creation, um, and which is really very simple. It's just about they're saying you're always claiming. Your consciousness is always in broadcast, and you're always claiming stuff into being. But they said, you know, they said this once to a client. They said, you know, imagine that you're floating on your belly on a raft in the ocean mm -hmm. and everything exists within the same ocean. Everything is in this field. And this is how you call the current to you, to call that thing to you or you bring yourself to it conversely. But you're not going to do that if you don't feel worthy of it. So that's, I think, some of the teaching of the, the box outside the door. They say, you know, we leave it, but you don't open the door to claim your own inheritance, what is there for you. How how would they say, or how have you heard them say, I, I have so many people who listen and who write in, who say, I hear you saying to believe in my greatness, to understand uh -huh. my greatness, but there is this block. Yeah, there's a block because the small self isn't going to do it. You know, the small self doesn't fix the small self. It mm -hmm. just doesn't happen. I would have done it already. You know what I mean? Through sheer force of will. If I could fix some, cert, some stuff I, with through force, I would do it. I would have done it already. I really do believe the small self doesn't fix the small self. Personality doesn't repair the personality. You can, you can pretend. Mm -hmm. you, can, you, can do, you can get your nose fixed or you can get, you know, I can get my a toupee if I want to. There's all kinds of things I can do on a cosmetic level if I want to for myself. And um, that's not the inherent being, you know. So how can I say this? Um, I'm going to go to the guys. The divine self is my The divine self knows who he is, knows who he is, and will claim that's you, and will claim into manifestation what he requires, what he requires to realize himself through, to realize himself through the small self. Cannot, the small self cannot. She doesn't know how. She doesn't know how. She couldn't find her way. She couldn't find her way, but if she aligns. But if she aligns to who and what she is, to who and what she is by claiming this in truth, by claiming this in truth, she will bring vibratory accord. She will bring vibratory accord to bear upon the situation, to bear upon the situation, mm -hmm. to bring everything into being that co-resonates as her, that co-resonates as her. Here is the example. Here is the example. I don't feel that I am worthy. I don't feel that I am worthy, claims unworthiness. Claims unworthiness. You are agreeing to that. You are agreeing to that. That is how you claim your life into being. That is how you claim your life into being, the divine as you. The divine as you, who knows who he is in truth, who knows who he is in truth as aligned to, as aligned to, knows he is worthy of the kingdom, knows he is worthy of the kingdom, which is the awareness of the presence, which is the awareness of the presence of the divine in all things, of the divine in all things, the divine as you. The divine as you is the one who claims into being, is the one who claims into being what is required, what is required to develop and learn through, to develop and learn through as you attend to this teaching. As you attend to this teaching, you need to fix yourself, the need to fix the self, to be in reparation, to be in reparation at a cosmetic level, on any cosmetic level to be released 
can be released because the true self, because the true self will support that decision, will support you in the manifestation that will hold in a way that will hold you. You can believe that you are too old and get your face fixed and get your face fixed to appear younger, to appear younger. That is a simple way. That is a simple way to claim an identity, to claim an identity, but you will not hold it. But you will not hold it. It's not your truth. It is not your truth until you realize who and what you are, until you realize who and what you are as existing beyond the clock, as existing beyond the clock, or they can be seen or the need to be seen as younger than perhaps you are, as younger than perhaps you are, the divine self as you. The divine self as you is what it is, is the one who does this work, not the small self, not the small self who seeks to replicate what she has known, who seeks to replicate what she has known, the small self. The small self relies on the known, relies on the known to claim identity, to claim identity. This is who I was taught to be. This is who I was taught to be or should resemble or should resemble. This is what I should look like. This is what I should live my life like. Live my life like, dependent on some principle, dependent upon some principle that I have known or inherited, that I have known or inherited. The divine self knows who he is. The divine self who knows who he is is not obliged, is not obliged to history in any way, is not obliged to history in any way. He knows he is eternal. He knows he is eternal. He knows he is worthy. He knows he is worthy. She knows her worth. She knows her worth. She doesn't have to prove it in this way. And in this way, she claims in manifestation. She claims into manifestation what she requires, what she requires to realize this through, to realize this through, period, period. So I don't know if that made sense. A lot of that did. There's, there's a couple questions that, that I have in there. Um, the, the first part is how do we step away or step to the side of the little self? And the second part that goes in there is mm. the, the boomerang effect. The, the Dalai Lama mm. talked about it in, in, when he first came to the West, how we can take a good teaching and use it against mm. ourselves. Oh, yeah. And I can hear that opportunity in this teaching as well. Judgment. Well, I, yeah, well, what you judge, you fear. I mean, here's the simple stuff. You know, when you make a choice in fear, you get more fear. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing something because I think I should, or because I'm fearful not to, more than likely I'm getting myself a whole bunch more fear. And then I'm operating as a small self. Mm -hmm. The true self who knows who he is isn't afraid in the same way. So you align to this. I think one of the easy ways to begin to work with this is to go to the idea of intent. You know, the guides say, you know, there's nothing wrong with having the house on the hill. Somebody gets to live there. Mm -hmm. That's where you want to live and you need the house. And it's a good place for you. And you, you have the, the, the funds for it. Enjoy it. But if I want the big house on the hill so that I'm the envy of my neighbors, um, I'm creating in fear. That would be the small self choosing. Now, is, it, remind me of your question. How do we... You said step aside from the small self. I said, I'm going to let the guides answer this. You don't step aside. You don't step aside. There is no stepping aside. There is no stepping aside, which was present, because you are always present. Mm -hmm. It's really about awareness and a claim of truth and a claim of truth when you claim these words. When you claim these words, I know, I'm truth. I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth, you align the field of truth. You align to the field of truth and the claim I am here. And the claim I am here, the divine as you in manifestation, the divine as you in manifestation claims a world in agreement with her, claims a world into agreement with her. This is not done through fixing things. This is not done through fixing things. You can't fix yourself at this level. You can't fix yourself at this level. You can't align, but you can align. We will continue. They're saying we will continue. He wants to interrupt. He wants to interrupt because I do. We will say these words. They're saying we will say these words. The choices you make as a small self. The choices you make as a small self or replication of history are always in replication of history. What you were taught to believe or be, what you were taught to believe or be, based on opinions, based on others' opinions, based on your church, based on your church, the times you grew up in, the times you grew up in, what have you, what have you. The small self. The small self knows herself through narrative history knows herself through narrative and history and history, the divine self. The divine self may operate in time, may operate in time as you, as you, but knows herself beyond that, but knows herself beyond that, so she is not adhering. So she is not adhering to anything that is not true, to anything that is not true. She understands it. 
She understands it. She recognizes what it is. She recognizes it for what it is, but she goes in her own way. But she goes in her own way, as she is called to, as she is called to. Now you may say this. They're saying, now you may say this. So the guides that I work with work with attunements to mm-hmm. vibration. And the attunements are done through more, you know, through 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 speech. There's a spoken spoken intonation or incantation, whatever you want to call it, or prayer. So the claim, I know who I am, which is the divine self claiming itself. I know what I am, which is again the divine self claiming itself. I know how I serve, which is the divine self claiming itself, is always true. They say it's always true, even when you don't agree to it or 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 acknowledge it, the true self knows who he is and so when that's claimed this is essentially an attunement to vibration what you're doing is you're bringing that alignment through and in that level of alignment you choose differently they actually say that that claim i know who i am i know what i am i know how i serve will call you into present time which is the only time we can know anything you know and when we're doing that we're not claiming in history in the ways that we've done in the past Beautiful, beautiful. So we should remember to say this. I know I have sticky notes. My wife put them around our house saying, I am here, I am here, I am here. (laughs) Yeah. That's the claim from the Book of Mastery. And Mm -hmm. again, that's an attunement. And it's a very powerful one. It's the divine self claiming I am here. Let's go. Thank you. Let's go from there. We may double back there. What I'd like to do is cover one last topic from this book and then hear what they've been teaching lately or what what you've been hearing most recently. But there's one more point in this book that I feel is so important. I believe the guides feel it's so important. It's understanding this, understanding the the Christedness, the authentic self, the divineness in everybody else else as well yeah. as ourselves yep well you know it's a very simple teaching and it's in the books i think it's probably in all the books but the guides say again and again you can't be the light and hold another in darkness it just can't be so it's a, it's a teaching of hypocrisy and unfortunately most religions have glommed on to that which is the we are right you are wrong and the guides say self-righteousness is always the small self without exception so you know, one of the very simple teachings that the guides bring forth is that, you know, the divine witnesses the divine in all that it sees. So when you align as the true self, that's how you perceive. And how you perceive another at this level is transformative to the other. So how can I say this? The claim, I know who you are, I mm-hmm. know what you are, I know how you serve, once again is always true. At, and again, please remember, it's not like Paul, the small self and the guy who, you know, sticks his foot in his mouth or forgets or does whatever. That's not the one who's claiming. It's the true self, the I am self. I know who you are. I know what you are. I know how you serve. And I'm addressing that aspect of you that is always present, the eternal self. And that will actually work with you as well to support your field in shifting or the claim you are here, you are here, you are here which will do the same thing, because again, it's not the personality self that's, that's out of operating here, and it's an activation of frequency. So there's, a, there's an exercise that the guys do, and it may be in that book, where they say, I see with the eyes of the Christ, which mm-hmm. is a level of, of consciousness and visioning. And when you do that, again, you can feel the energy, and you'll lift it. And it, when, when people look at you with that intention, it's quite something. I mean, your whole field shifts. Is is that a difficult exercise to share with people? Not at all. You know, not at all. Um, I mean, it's a very simple one. I mean, it usually begins with attunement, mm-hmm. which is lately, I mean, the guides are now using I know who I am in truth because they say the truth is a field. And when you're operating in that field of truth, they say, in, you know, in truth, a lie will not be held. And the lie is that we're not good enough or unworthy or he's a bad person or whatever we would judge, you know, because at this level of consciousness, you move beyond those descriptors, which are really all based in sort of duality and personality and then all of those things. So, um, but, you know, very simply what they'll often do in a workshop is they'll get people working with the energy and then they'll have people in partners and they'll say, you know, I see the one before me with the eyes of the Christ. And you can feel the transmission, you can feel the transmission. I mean, it's literally coming out of the eyes and lifting the people up. Um, and it's an amazing way to be seen. 
because you're being seen in love. You know, the, uh, they say that the eyes of the Christ, don't, they don't fear, they don't hold fear, and they don't hold judgment. Um, and when you see another at this level, you're really witnessing them in a very, very high way. And you're witnessing the inherent worth and perfection of that being. You're not trying to, you know, get them to look the way you think they should look or behave the way you think they should behave or whatever it would be, because this doesn't exist at that level. When people are met at this level, in fact, they are transformed. You're not affirming. You're not affirming a negative. You're claiming their inherent perfection at this level of awareness. Um, the guides have been teaching more recently that how we see anything informs the material realm. So as they lift us in mm -hmm. consciousness, as they lift our frequency, as we're able to hold this vision, you know, for others in the world, we're actually reclaiming or recreating our world, they say, in a higher octave. They don't talk about dimensions. They talk about octaves. I mean, that's just their language. So, you know, when they talk about, you know, singing in a higher octave or expressing in a higher octave, it's a higher level of tone or consciousness and that informs what you see and then lifts that into being as well. It's, it's quite something because you can really experience it. You know, I mean, this is something that's, you know, if, if it's not experiential, it sounds hokey. But once you begin to have the experience of feeling a vibration or being in a room full of people where the whole room feels like it's just lifting with you, which is what happens in the workshop. We just all stand and go, whoa, we just feel the energy lift us all up. You know, you begin to have a very different comprehension of what's possible as a way of being in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing on that. And just a, a real mm -hmm. short side note, and then I, I want to hear where what you've been learning today. Actually, this is part of what you're learning today. But there's mm -hmm. when we look at a person this way, I just want to clarify, if I understand it right, there's a big difference between seeing the action of a person, which could be still horrible, terrible, whatever, and yeah. seeing the person for who they truly are. Exactly right. Yeah, it's not condoning behavior. It's not. It's never been about that. It's, I, I've, I've never heard anything like that from the guides. But how can I, let me let them say what you know someone is. When you know who someone is, at the level we teach, at the level we teach, you're claiming truth. You are claiming them in truth, the behavior you dismantle. The behavior you, dis you dismantle by claiming them in truth, by claiming them in truth, the realization of who they are. The realization of who and what they are outside of what they've done, outside of what they present is what will heal them, is what will heal them, condemnation. Condemnation has never healed anybody. Body is the creation of war. It's a it's the creation of war. We will condemn those people there. We will condemn those people over there. We will be righteous. We will be righteous at the cost of our truth. At the cost of our truth, the truth of your being, the truth of your being, your inherent divine worth, your inherent divine worth, divine worth knows it. Remember, knows the truth of everybody. There is no convincing involved. There is no convincing involved. Inside. You don't have to decide that someone's a good person. That that someone is a good person or bad, you realize them at a higher level. You realize them at a higher level. You affirm that aspect of them. You affirm that aspect of them and they begin to manifest. And they begin to manifest or at least realign or at least realign their own divine potential to their own divine potential. They brought up the term truth a lot, which sounds like yeah. a good segue to ask what are they sharing today or where have they taken the teachings now? Well, you know, they started delivering the Book of Truth last, I don't know, February, March, I think it was. Um, and that was about 30 days worth of dictation over a couple of months of sessions. And they still are teaching that in workshops, but they've moved beyond it as well. Mm -hmm. And now they're teaching freedom and they're teaching the energy of freedom, which is pretty astonishing. And the claim, I am free, I am free, I am free, which is, again, a claim made by the divine self. And the guides say, you know, what's, what, what is true is always true. And the true self or the divine self is always free. So, again, it's always true, even if you're incarcerated or you're, you're wherever. The true self is always free. And when you work with this, the shift is sort of a, the shift is astonishing. People 
describe it as sort of dropping an overcoat Mm -hmm. or leaving a robe behind. And that robe or that heaviness is really, according to the guides, all of the agreements that have been made by the small self in fear or to acquiesce to structures or, you know, government or religion or all of these things that we've been entrenched in at the cost of our freedom or liberation. So that's where they're taking us. And the only thing that I've heard about the next book, and I suppose they could change it on me, is that it's going to be called the Book of Freedom. And I assume what they're beginning to do now is prepare those teachings, um, because that book will be channeled probably within the next six months sometime. So as soon as I can sit down for a stretch of time, they'll bring it through. So that's where the teachings have been going. Um, The energy in the workshops continues to accelerate so we're still having these these sort of large experiences that are very personal to people and i also think that you know what's really going on is there this work they say again and again is not selfish work this isn't about this isn't just about feeling better that's never been the purpose of this teaching it's about realization and i think personal realization as it supports the realization of the whole and the consciousness of this this plane that we exist in and that's the bigger agenda here and always really has been so you know while they begin with the individual and the development of the individual in the first three books now in this next series of books book of mastery book of truth and whatever the next one is whether it's book of freedom or not is much more about claiming a whole new world into being i mean this is really their teaching And they say that this is done by and through us, you know, individually and collectively as we align to this level of of awareness and agreement to who and what we truly are. Have they given an indication, they mentioned it at the beginning of this book, that it's coming. Have they given an indication of what this shift looks like? They talked about it. You know, I did a workshop in Richmond over the weekend, and they lectured on that for about half an hour and I haven't heard the recording yet. I mean, it was, I was, I was, you know, I retained about a third Mm -hmm. of what comes through me, but they're not talking about, you know, they're, they're not talking about this as, you know, everybody, you know, riding around on rainbows and, 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 and unicorns. It's not about that. I mean, they say that we're in for great change and, and, and they, they've said that everything that is not, in alignment to truth is going to be lifted and changed. It has to be, it has to be remade in a higher way. And, you know, they say this again and again, you know, in truth, a lie will not be held. And in the frequency of truth, a lie cannot be held. And this is true for the individual and for the collective. So they've said that what we're undergoing now is this transformation of this plane. Mm -hmm. Um, into this higher awareness. But what does it look like? I'll see if they want to say anything. It's only one thing. We will say only one thing. It will not be, expected. It will not be what you expect because you never expect because you could never expect it. It's not made itself known yet. It has not made itself known in the world. And even as you predict a new world, you bring the seeds of the old to it, you bring the seeds of the old to it because you, to be there because you expect it to be there. And once again, that is history. And once again, that is history. So you can make itself pronounced seeking to make itself pronounced in the world we say a new world we said is made in consciousness first is made in consciousness first required and the alignment that's required for all of you for all of you to be in realization to be in realization is presenting itself rapidly and often out of necessity and often out of necessity when you're no longer comfortable in your life when you are no longer comfortable in your old life you claim that gifted to you you claim what may be gifted to you in the world you live in when the world you've lived you know it no longer supports your expectations of what a world should do for what a world should do you claim the one into being you claim a new what into being as long as you're satisfied as long as you are satisfied with what you've had with what you have had and that you will continue to claim that we will assure you but we will assure you the days are coming the days are coming when even those securities when even those securities must be re-understood must be re-understood and decided upon anew and decided upon anew for the good of all and they're saying for the good of all period yes you know and they're saying you know yes you know and i mean I, one of the you know they've said many many times you know we are our brother's keepers like mm-hmm. it or not you know we really do have accountability to the whole here 
Thank you. And it's it's something I'm getting confirmation with with other guests like um, mm -hmm. Dr. Joe Dispenza, for instance, that these these group events now, there is a changing in the field. There is a changing in the energies going on. And particularly mm -hmm. these group events now, the attunement or vibration, I don't I don't have better words for it. Everything is shifting upwards. Yeah, that's how I experience it as well. Can you tell us what would they say as guidance, for lack of another term, for parents, for kids today? That's an interesting question, Weapons. They are love them as they are and celebrate the fact that they are here because of the world, because they will be the inheritors of a new world. It's not about doing what you should. It's not about doing what you should to keep them as they are, to keep them as they are, but claiming them. It's about claiming them and their realization and their realization of what they truly are, of who and what they truly are beyond what's been ascribed to them, beyond what's been ascribed to them, my smart child. Look at my smart child, affirms the smart child, affirms the smart child, what an amazing being, what an amazing being affirms the wholeness of the child, affirms the wholeness of the child. We see each of you as whole. We see each of you as whole. We recognize your beauty. We recognize your beauty even as you don't, even as you don't claim the beauty. Claim the beauty, the inherent beauty, the inherent beauty in all you see before you. In all you see before you, not before, then you will have a beautiful world, period, period, period. The same period. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So just a, a few wrap-up questions, and then if we have sure. time for a brief exercise we had sure. talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The first question I like to ask all of our guests before the end is, what personally actually brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? Well, that's an interesting question, because I suppose it varies. Um, you know, for me, I want to say, say that it is realization. Mm -hmm. It's the aha moments of being. I mean, they're spectacular when they come. Um, and I, I suppose I live in expectation of their presence now, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, and I mean, what, being, what brings me the most joy really is loving other people. When I'm finding myself able to do that, that's the great love. That's, that's the great joy is just being able to be in that place. You know, when the guides step through me in workshops and they work with people individually, and it's, mm -hmm. there's, it's really interesting because my eyes often change color. They run a very pale blue when, when this happens. I've never seen it, but I keep hearing reports of it. The love that comes through me as them is, is astonishing to me and, you know, and humbling truthfully as well. And, um, you know, to be, to be party to it in the presence of, so the gift of being in that place in my own life is something that I hope for all the time. Hasn't happened, but I believe it will. I'm hoping for coming to one of your events. <laughs> Please do. Just let me know. I would. Great I would love to have you. I guess that's a perfect segue. Where, uh, unplanned, but it works great. Where can people go to find out more, to find your books, and to find your work? Well, the books are available in, in booksellers, you know, in Barnes and Noble and, you know, all the bookstores mostly. And you can get them on Amazon and all the online sites as well. Or you can go to my website, which is just my name, Paul Selig, P-A-U-L-S-E-L-I-G.com. Um, and you can find the links there. And there's a list of events, too. And you can sign up for the newsletter. I do a live stream on Wednesdays. We actually have a new series starting up very shortly. But mm -hmm. I do these on an ongoing basis and the guides are coming through and teaching there and attuning people and taking questions. So if you can't get to a workshop, the live streams are, are wonderful and the workshops I do two or three a month on, in most cases and I'm all over the country. So, you know, um, I'm often at the Esalen Institute in California and Omega and the Kripala center. I'm there every year and beyond that, I'm all over. So sign up for the newsletter and you'll, you'll get the calendar. And I do readings. It takes a while to get them, but um, they're good when, when you can find one. So that's what I'm up to. Fantastic. Thank you. And if you didn't catch the link to that, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll get you over to Paul and Paul's website as well. So thank you so much for this. Before we dive into a, a brief exercise, do you have uh -huh. any last words of wisdom or words of wisdom that they would like to share? 
And they're saying only one thing, allow yourself to be. Allow yourself to be. Stop hurting yourselves. Stop trying to fix yourself. Stop deciding, deciding that you are not where you're supposed to be. It's almost ten. And it's only in the moment that you stand in the or something you may know your true self. She is somebody in the corner. She is not waiting around the corner. He is not waiting for next year. He is not waiting for you next year. He is here now. He is here now as you, as you, when you say welcome, when you say welcome, the divine as you, the divine as you, the presence of the divine source as you, the presence of the divine source as you has come to be, has come to be. We would like to take this attunement. We would like to take you through this attunement if you join us. If you would join us, these are what we would ask you to repeat very softly. These are the words we would ask you to repeat very softly. I know I'm truth. I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. I am free. I am free. I am free. When you claim these words, you align in vibration, you align in vibration, the field that we hold, to the field that we hold. These words are always true. These words are always true, they'll always support you, and will always support you in vibration, in vibration, as you attend to them, as you attend to them, the truth of what you are. The truth of who and what you are is always present, is always present, cannot be hidden, and cannot be hidden, finally, finally, because yes, I mean, because it is the essence of your being. Don't try to find it. Don't try to find it. Allow it to be you. Allow it to be you. It is here. 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 It seeks expression and seeks expression as and through you, as and through you in all ways, in all ways. We have come to sing your song for you. We have come to sing your song for you, so that you may learn the words, the divine as you, the divine as you has come, has come. Please say this with us. Please say this with us. I am word through my body. I am word through my body. Word, I am word. Word, I am word. I am word through my vibration. I am word through my vibration. Word, I am word. Word, I am word. I am word through my knowing of myself. Word, I am. I am word through my knowing of myself. Word, I, <laughs> I am word. I am word. Through my knowing. Through my knowing. Of myself. Of myself. As word. As word. Word, I am word. Word, I am word. I am here. 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 And they're saying blessings to you and good night. So the attunement to the word is the attunement to the vibration of the word. I'm word through my body, word, I am word. I'm word through my vibration, word, I am word. I am word through my knowing of myself as word. You can claim I am word through the one I see before me, word, I am word. I am word through my eyes, word, I am word. I am word through my life, if you wish. And you're bringing the energy of the divine to bear where it's called. You're not fixing things. You're claiming the presence of, of source. And the claim, I am here, I am here, I am here, is the true self announcing itself. And they say, when you work with this, you're claiming, you're giving permission, really, for the true self to claim purview or claim the life before you in the highest way. Woohoo! <laughs> Paul, I feel great. I mean, I feel really, really, I've got this like Cheshire cat grin on my face right now. Uh -huh. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. No words. <laughs> thank you for having me on your show. I'm grateful for the opportunity. I will crank it up for the finish, and I definitely want to attend one of your events. Happy to have you. Just let me know. Will do. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the book of knowing and worth, and discover your own greatness, and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. And thank you, guides. They're nodding. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I get the nod, so thank you. All right. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>